see. Yeah. So you've just got to believe it because it's part of your identity as a Catholic. Incidentally, I went to Catholic school my junior year of high school, but it didn't take. Actually, that went back too far. Yeah. So that, that didn't take. It just got me thinking about how to break the mole, how to break the hold of pseudoscience when it becomes a matter of religious faith to believe that these things are impossible. So the charge has been made that evolution will corrupt society, turn our youth into rampaging animals that will violently reject all morality and breed freely in the streets. I hear that all the time. That's certainly what I was taught. But the flaws of that premise are not hard to find. The problem apparently is the relative randomness of evolution. And this randomness, this partial random element is supposed to rob our lives of meaning, though it's not totally random, it's more of a filter. But there is some hope because there's just an excellent analogy that was relevant to any claim that randomness must lead to immorality. I mean, the, the process of meiosis is also random, whereby your parents' chromosomes rearrange themselves and then recombine. I mean, meiosis determines your physical form, the color of your hair and your eyes and your blood type and all of your selectable traits. It's because of the rolling of chromosomal dice and then their recombination. And that's mostly random. There's a lot of randomness to it. But we've somehow managed to accept that High schools are able to teach meiosis just fine, and you don't see priests and preachers attacking the theory of meiosis and trying to get it taken out of schools. Nobody claims that meiosis is a religion or demands the freedom to teach faith-based alternatives. We're able to accept that there are some aspects of biology that do involve an element of randomness, and we're still able to maintain emotional balance. So there, there doesn't need to be such a conflict. If we might look to Europe one more time, you'll see a continent bereft of Satan-worshipping fascists poised to destroy us on the orders of the Antichrist. Instead, you'll find people with a higher rate of acceptance of evolution, but consistently lower violent crime than America. <laughs> Clearly, it is possible to embrace reality and not descend into anarchy. But something else occurred to me. Christians everywhere will tell me that my life can't have meaning unless I accept God's plan for my life. And this is something which they themselves must believe to be emotionally stable. But being a, a bit of a sci-fi buff, I started to really think about that. Really, that just put yourself in this position. If there really was a centralized power who you think created you and was able to dictate every nuance of your life, would that really be such a good thing? Really think about that for a moment. Is that what you really want? A central power dictating every single nuance of your life. Would it be such a good thing? It seems like, well, God's will is whatever you feel inside yourself emotionally. So it seems like an excuse for many Christians to kind of exalt their own ego. To me, it seems like. But I've watched enough Robot Rebellion movies to seriously doubt the premise that a uh, higher being ruling every nuance of your life would actually be such a good thing. But aren't I afraid of meaninglessness and death? I can take a broader view where the cycle of nature reveals that all life is within all other life, where everything living and dead continues to live within everything else. And of course, Darwin said that there is grandeur in this view of life, but also freedom. Freedom from paranoid superstitions about a magical man in the sky watching and judging me. Freedom from outmoded dietary restrictions that never really made much sense for me anyway. And freedom to enrich my life with as much knowledge as possible without the foolhardy need to censor evidence to protect a myth and to get another degree, yay. Confronted with a deconversion story like this, some Christians will lament the fact that I was just raised in the wrong church. It was just such a weird church. Maybe if I got in the right church, and others will wonder whether or not I have considered any other religions before diving headlong into humanism. So on that note, I'd like to conclude with a quote attributed to the Buddha that I've always found particularly impressive. Believe nothing on the faith or traditions, even though they have been held in honor for many generations and in diverse places. Do not believe a thing because many people speak of it. Do not believe on the faith of the sages of the past. 
Do not believe what you yourself have imagined, persuading yourself that a God inspires you. Believe nothing on the sole authority of your masters and priests. After examination, believe what you yourself have tested and found to be reasonable and conform your conduct thereto. And hold on, there was one more slide at the very end. That's the one. If you'd like to know more about Armstrongism and its consequences, here is a very compelling book written by a woman named Kalisha Williams, who was in roughly the same religion, and she lived in the same part of Missouri I did. It's actually a wonder I never met her. And she was actually invested in the Quiverful movement. She had seven kids and taught them young earth creationism. And she was in the same kind of Armstrongist religion that I got out of. And her book is a very powerful and compelling story if you'd like to learn more about the sect. And that's about it. Any questions? Uh, I, I didn't understand on your slide um, that had the uh, uh, mark of the beast, the number 666 what that had to do with the barcode. There are various theories and half-baked interpretations on what the mark of the beast is. Um, a lot of them are paranoid theories based upon a, a threat of a one world government. Various Christian churches interpret it differently. Uh, the mark of the beast is often anything that your church strongly disagrees with. So there are a lot of churches who believe that um, the mark of the beast is going to be some kind of a microchip that the Antichrist, who, who rules Europe and possibly the United Nations, he's going to order everyone implanted with this microchip or a barcode. And the theory is you will not be able to buy or sell unless you get this barcode embedded inside of you. And see, then the whoever has the barcode will be the ones that will have privileges with the beast power but see, Jesus, see, those people are the enemies of Jesus who get the beast's microchip embedded inside them. That's one, one theory. There are many others. How did you end up here? <laughs> here, well. So after I pretty much concluded that God can be fairly readily explained as a psychological projection, I started going on the internet and I started watching uh, a lot of atheist videos on YouTube. There's a vast collection of atheist videos and many of them encouraged people to look into their local community and see if you can find like-minded, free-thinking people. I did so when I found the St. Joseph Skeptics Group and I met the Lewins. And it was kind of confusing because these people say they're so skeptical and then they're going to this church. <laughs> that kind of confused me and then they told me about the church so I decided to check it out for myself. This one. Uh, 
okay. I gather you feel comfortable here, and and uh, have you looked into the other parts of UUism, or you're just content to come to church? So far, um, if I can get a job in Kansas City, then I might become more deeply involved. I come when I can, but uh, the trip makes it difficult. But I would get more involved if I were able to find a good job in Kansas City and move closer. Have you, have you, had any, have you met or had any discussions with any of your co colleagues within your discipline who have a, 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 a a somewhat combining, well, what I've heard of this whole group of science scientists who say they combine theology with science and don't have any trouble with either one of them. Have you had any, have met any people like that? Uh, not personally. I, I've read um, a lot of their books, and some of their arguments just, I mean, many of them, are, they are good scientists, but there's a lot of arguments that don't really make much sense. Like Francis Collins, the guy who was responsible for the Human Genome Project, he, he, he's a smart scientist. He sequenced the human genome, or was largely responsible for it. He's hiking in the woods one day, and it's kind of wintry, and he sees a waterfall. The waterfall is frozen. The frozen waterfall splits into three branches of ice. From this, he decides that the Trinity must be real and becomes a Christian. <laughs> and yeah, I know you're a good scientist, but that totally doesn't follow. <laughs> just, that just doesn't follow at all. It seems like it's just, it seems like it's a better explanation that the, our idea of these Abrahamic gods, to me, it seems like they're psychological projections. And to me, that seems like a better explanation than random clues left behind in nature that could be variously interpreted in totally inconsistent ways by different people, to me. <laughs> I, was, I was just wondering if you're uh, getting ready to publish a book, if you had a, this material boiled down, it would both be amusing and profitable to read. Well, I've been making some YouTube videos. Uh, I've not written specifically a book on this subject. It will require a lot of research. I, it's possible, I guess. You have, you've never talked to an agent then about a book? Not yet, though, no. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. You say you like science fiction. What are some of your favorite science fiction works? Oh, well. I kind of oscillate between uh, Star Trek and Star Wars. Uh, let's see. In terms of novels, uh, I've read some Isaac Asimov. Actually, his short stories are, are I think, better, actually, than his novels. Um, sometimes I delve into space opera. There's, uh, there's really a, a vast, vast selection of choices out there. Uh, I guess Charles Strauss is a good author. He's British. Um, let's see, who else? Orson Scott Card is a good one. There are many, many possibilities. Okay. David, I, I'm sure glad you uh, did this today. I'm glad we gave you a ride down here a few times to, to get you hooked a little bit. But on the, um, your crit criticism of the religion you were brought up in is very similar to my criticism of Christian science, which I was brought up in. Mm. I'm pretty hard on it too. But within, you talked about Christianity uh, as a kind of a broad term, but within that uh, spectrum, there are mainstream and even liberal Christian churches and denominations. Are you uh, equally critical of those uh, group organizations as well as you were of the, uh, uh, the one that you grew up in? Well, that depends. There is a uh, rigid conservative biblical literalism, which I, I will call nonsense. There are other moderate liberal Christians who apparently it's impossible to pin them down. Sometimes they can talk about biblical literalism 
But if you try to figure out what they really believe, there are some denominations where their beliefs become nebulous. And if your beliefs are totally nebulous, then there's not really any way to specifically disprove them. It's just that uh, something else I've also been reading, if you try to look into the history of Christianity, th this is actually a, a, a big mistake. If you're a Christian and you try to examine the historicity of Christianity, then you run into even more problems. Uh, actually, I think we had another odyssey. I didn't catch all of it. It was much earlier in the summer. There was a, another presenter, I forget his name, um, who maintains something that I have also found to be true, that if you were to try to get back to the actual history of Christianity, you'll find that there is virtually no support for any of the historical claims that would actually meet the standard used by modern historians. For example, uh, no one in the first century wrote down anything that Jesus said or did. No one who was actually contemporaneous to Jesus. So if you, you read the Gospels, and there's this huge movement sweeping the countryside, and it culminates with the Jews breaking one of their own laws, which I, I know a little bit about, having been forced to live them. <laughs> the Jews breaking some of their own laws to kill a prisoner on a high holy day. None of the Jewish writers of the time noticed this, none of the contemporaneous writers. Uh, there's a guy named Philo of Alexandria uh, who lived all throughout those times. He wrote books about Christians persecute, well not Christians, but he wrote books about people persecuted under Pontius Pilate. Somehow, he has no clue Jesus ever existed, and he was living all throughout those days. And I guess the other biggest, biggest problem would be the crucifixion miracles. Like, you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and not John, strangely. You read them, and when Jesus dies, the sun goes dark, there's an earthquake, and Jewish saints rise from their graves and are wandering through Jerusalem, talking to many people, and somehow, no one living in those times notices this. Not a single writer felt that was worth commenting on. You know, and, and that just kind of really hit home for me. Also, the, the Gospel of John, if you read John, he doesn't seem to notice the zombies either. So, it seems like it's much more easily explained to me as myth-making. I know some people disagree, and you can't totally prove Jesus never existed. It just seems like the foundations are mythological. I can't prove it, but it seems to me like a, a more plausible explanation that it's, it's kind of in the same caliber as Hercules, to me at least. Does any, oh. You've planted a seed. Would you be interested in helping it grow? So much of what I, you've said, I'd like to hear more about. We have classes and whatever. I'll go to St. Joe and get you and bring you back out because I love it. I guess so. That's quite a tribute <laughs> to, uh, to, to end on. I wish I knew who the speaker was for the next Odyssey, which will be back at Simpson House. Anybody know who it is? Yes, you're right. Yes, it's the young people who went to Boston, and that will occur over in Simpson House again. Uh, and then on the 31st, we're back to the forum routine. Thank you very much, and thank you very, very, very much, Mr. Ricks. <laughs>